Okay, good morning, everyone. Again, Dr. Andresi, we'd like to thank you for your presentation. Thank you for sharing your story. And also, thank you for the work that you do. I'm truly, um, truly appreciative of all the work that you do, and we applaud your determination, your strength, and vision to see a different future, but to also work towards a, a different future and sharing that with so many young people. A good morning again, everyone. My name is Tamara Barron, and I'm the Occupational Coordinator for Maryland's Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. The Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation is responsible for providing a comprehensive education program for adults incarcerated in Maryland's prisons. And it give me, gives me great pleasure to welcome you to session number seven, Education in Prison. In this session, our panel will present three papers followed by our discussant who will share key takeaways from each paper as well as the issues and implications for stakeholders and policymakers. Just a couple of housekeeping items on your tables. You have been provided with paper and also pens. So we ask that you write down any questions that you might have, and there will be time to share those observations and or concerns a bit later in the presentation. I will now briefly introduce each of our presenters. Now their full bios are in your folders on the right hand side. Also in your folders to the left are one page summaries of each paper that is to be presented this morning. Now, paper number one, Understanding Educational Aspiration Among People in Prison. That will be presented to you by Ruth Delaney, Program Manager, Vera Institute of Justice, and Lionel Smith, Research Associate, Vera Institute of Justice. The second paper to be presented is Prison-Based Education, Programs, Participation, and Proficiency and Literacy and Numeracy. That will be presented by Jing Hong Kai, Research Analyst, Center for Public Education, National School Board Association. And with her, we also have Dr. Ruhil, Professor, Ohio University, and who will be answering questions, correct? Okay. And another co-author, Diane Good, Ohio University. Uh, she was unable to be with us today, but I'm sure the team will be able to answer any questions that you might have. Our third paper, Incarcerated Adults with Low Skills. Findings from the 2014 Piauk Prison Study. Margaret Patterson, Senior Researcher, Research Allies for Lifelong Learning. Followed by our discussant, Stephen Stewart, Cure National Reentry Education Advocate, Cure National Council of States and Governments and followed by the paper presentations and a presentation from our discussant. We will host a question and answer session. If time allows, we will do some round table discussions. And without further ado, we will have our first set of presenters. Come on up. Hi, everyone. Got trapped by the chairs. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, we're uh, <coughs> glad to be talking about our research with the PIAC data. I'm Ruth Delaney. Lionel will be coming up to talk about our, um, our findings in just a minute, but I'm going to introduce what this paper is about. So I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I know it's annoying to put up a slide and then say you're not going to talk about it, but we're here from the Vera Institute of Justice. If you'd like to know more about what we do, um, I would love to talk to you after this presentation. Um, we're working in the area of post-secondary education in prison. Um, with the larger goal of making higher education more available to more people in prison and after release through a number of different strategies, including technical assistance, policy advocacy most recently, and through conducting research, of which this paper is a part. So this paper examines educational aspiration among people in prison specifically the role that cognitive skills and demographic and socioeconomic factors play in shaping interest in education programs. Um, the backstory to this is that the majority of the research on education in prison has focused on outcomes relevant to criminal justice policymakers, specifically recidivism and employment. Much of this research calls for randomized controlled trials to control for differences in motivation, ambition, and other characteristics of students who enroll in higher education in prison as compared to those who don't. These statements tend to frame motivation as a binary characteristic, 
as if it's something that exists within a student or does not. Our interest in the PIAC data and what became the study stemmed from this question of motivational differences between students who enroll and those who don't, a very important question to understand the outcomes that we're seeing. While our specific analysis grew into a broader set of research questions, our engagement with this research comes from an interest in examining whether motivation um, is more continuous, perhaps, uh, than we were seeing it being discussed as. Um, basically, uh, what we wanted to do was find out whether and why people in prison would like to enroll in school. So there's a couple of terms which all of you as education researchers are probably familiar with. We're going to be talking about educational attainment, achievement, and aspiration. Looking at the literature, as I just mentioned, before I explain what these are, I do want to say a couple of summary statistics which Dr. Andrews mentioned as well, that there are 2.2 million people behind bars in the United States today. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, the 700% increase in incarceration since 1970 um, has been associated or concentrated among people with very low levels of educational attainment. Nearly all of the increase has been among young men without high school educations and especially young black men. But we know from the PIAC data that 70% of people in prison say they would like to enroll in education programs, although only 42% ever do. So. Looking at the research, we saw that the criminological research, um, as I mentioned, is focused on criminal justice outcomes <coughs> in a lot of ways. That makes sense. It's criminological research. Um, it looks at recidivism, violence in prison, and the influence of education programs, and increases in employment after release. Education research, however, and this is not specific to education research on people who are in prison, but in general, when they look at, when education researchers look at attainment and achievement questions, um, and aspiration questions, you see a black-white achievement gap, a wealth gap, um, education, and the idea of education as a means for social mobility, which we all talked about quite a bit yesterday. Um, the prison education research, which have, of which there's only been a very small amount, that really looks at education programs in prison in order to look at the education outcomes associated with them rather than other types of outcomes, have found that prison affects <coughs> cognitive ability, that it can actually um, make it more difficult to learn and uh, lower test scores. Um, incarcerated GED holders tend to have very strong literacy skills, uh, especially compared to the general population. Um, and that achievement measures may actually predict educational aspiration, which is what we're really interested in looking at here. So our research questions, before I hand this over to Lionel, um, are these questions. What demographic and skill level factors predict the aspiration to enroll in any education class or program among people in prison in the United States? We're not talking on this first question about post-secondary education specifically, but any type of education <coughs> program. The second research question, we tried to drill down into post-secondary education because that is our, our major focus area at Vera, um, was to look at what demographic and skill level factors predict the aspiration to enroll in a post-secondary education class or program among people in prison. I'm going to call up Lionel now to, to walk us through what we found. Thank you, Ruth. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, before we get into what we found out, first discuss sort of the data we used uh, to answer our questions as well as the methodological uh, approach that we took. Um, so regarding our data source, um, I guess we're the first to talk about it, but we used the 2014 uh, PIAC prison study uh, public use files. Um, and so for, again, we had two research questions. For the first, um, our sample included um, just under 1,200 people who answered uh, one of the background questions uh, in the survey, which was, um, do you want to enroll in an academic class or program of study. Um, however, overall in this data set, if you're familiar with it, there were about just over 1,300 respondents. The reason that our initial sample is lower than that is because this initial question was only asked to, uh, one, those people who were not currently involved in education programming while in prison, and then two, those who indicated that they had um, attained at least a seventh grade level of uh, education. So there was, uh, couple hundred people who were omitted from our sample. Um, and for our second research question, the dependent variable, 
uh, was a subsample of that initial uh, research question one sample, um, which is those of those who indicated they did have a desire for education, um, those who indicated having either interest in post-secondary education or higher or, or lower. Right, so we made that um, a binary variable. Uh, originally, it was a categorical, categorical variable that had 11 different valid responses corresponding to different levels or types of education pro programming that one could desire to receive, uh, ranging from grades one to six all the way through a doctoral degree. Uh, in terms of method, we use in research question one, we use binary logistic regression. Um, and we use a total of four different models, again, to assess sort of the variables that were <coughs> statistically significantly associated um, with having a desire for educational program. And then the second research question, we intended to use a binary logistic regression, but as I'll explain later, we had to resort to a different uh, technique, which was the chi-squared test of association. Just to quickly, I, I, I've already been flashed already, so just to quickly kind of go through uh, <coughs> the data and uh, the variables that we use. So um, again, we have two research questions. So for each, um, we used uh, a series of covariates, those control variables, um, gender, age, race, uh, racial identification, uh, one's own personal education attainment level, uh, their own, if they knew it, their parental education uh, attainment level, and of course we use um, the cognitive domain and uh, variables, literacy uh, and numeracy. Um, and for other reasons I can't, I'll probably not have time to explain, we did not look at uh, problem solving in technology rich environments. All right, on to the findings. So in terms of research question one, before I get to the findings of the, the regression analysis, uh, first thing's important to highlight sort of the descriptive statistics of those who first indicated they had a desire for uh, any type of educational programming. So among those who were asked, 70% of the respondents did in, in fact indicate that they would like to enroll in some education program of some type. And we just looked closely at, these are, among, this, these are uh, descriptive statistics of those who said yes, right? So of, among the females and males, over 70% over and above, and I won't go through each one. What I will highlight are two things. Uh, the first is, it's notable, those who are 55 years old or above, um, most respondents indicate that they did, not, they did not have a desire for any type of educational programming. And then the second thing I'll point out here is if we look at the cognitive domain mean scores, for those who said yes, they had a desire for both literacy and numeracy, they had on average higher scores in those domains than those who did not have a desire. So on to the regression um, findings. So again, we ran four different models. So model one just included uh, the covariates, uh, demographic variables. Model two had all the covariates plus just literacy, plausible values. Model three had numeracy, um, or covariates and only numeracy. And then model four, we included both types of cognitive domains. Um, here displayed are the odds ratios only for those variables that were significantly associated with having a desire for education. Um, as you can see, uh, so the reference groups uh, for, for age, for example, were those who were 25 to 34. So in comparison to that group, those who, for all, you know, basically 35 and above, and in each of the models that was statistically associated, significantly associated with having a desire. Um, regarding race, um, only for those who were of Hispanic or Latino origin, um, that was the only sort of significant, uh, uh, significantly correlated um, uh, race variable. And then regarding the plausible values, um, each of them were significant individually in their relative, uh, the respective models where they were by themselves, but then when we put them in the fourth model together, uh, they both became um, non-significant. Uh, so the summary is, you know, one thing I'll say is among the youth pro prison population, higher cognitive skills are associated with a greater interest in educational programs. Uh, really fast, um, cross tab. So research question two again looked at those who specifically desire a post-secondary education 
or higher. So among those who first said they had a desire for education, 81% of those <coughs> said that they actually had um, a desire for post-secondary education or higher. Um, I won't go through the same chart again, but I think, again, a couple of things are important. Remember I mentioned before, 55 and above, overall they did not indicate a desire, but when we talk, for those who did, nearly 90% of them um, indicated they had a post-secondary, uh, a desire for post-secondary educational programming. And another thing that's very important to uh, note here is that below high school, so for those who did not have a high school uh, degree or equivalent, um, already uh, the minority uh, of them uh, in this population indicated um, a desire for post-secondary education. Um, so I mentioned before we intended to do a binary logistic, logistic regression for this second question as well. We, uh, there were some issues with the data set. So number one, the sample size is already fairly small, a little over uh, 1,300 overall, 1,190 for our um, sample. But one thing, so we could not, uh, when we did cross tabs, we did not have enough, for many of the categories, enough cases to make statistically significant inferences about some of those uh, interact um, relationships between those variables. Instead, we did a chi-squared test of association to at least, if we can't uh, discuss the, the person level sort of factors, we can look at at least what variables among them, independent variables could or are associated um, with having Asian uh, is, as we sh as I illustrated, is associated with both one's personal and parental levels of education. But although they were in the minority, um, there are many people who do not even have a high school uh, level of education who, in fact, still have aspirations to receive a post secondary education. Uh, and with that, I'll just. Oop. <laughs> uh, Ruth will talk very briefly about the implications of our work. I'll be very brief because I have been on the later end of panels before and I know it's very rude to take time at the beginning. So um, very quickly, aspirations, what we've learned from what Lyle just talked about, um, we see that aspirations in prison outstrip opportunities. High school is the highest level of education programming that is consistently available in prison, um, but we see many people are interested in post-secondary opportunities. Um, some states mandate high school completion in prison, but not all do. Um, access to post-secondary education is even more limited. In one recent analysis, uh, Aaron Castro found over 200 higher, educations, higher education programs were taught in prisons nationwide, but there are about 2,000 prisons nationwide. So among incarcerated people, we also found, or what our findings suggest is that educational attainment may not, attainment meaning high school completion or other types of completed programs, may not be as strong a predictor of interest in education as assessed cognitive skill. In addition, uh, this is great, really, we find this to be a great finding, because um, skill building is something that can uh, be done at any time in someone's educational trajectory. Um, skill building can be accomplished through offering adult, challenging adult basic education courses and college prep courses, even where college programs do not yet exist. So you can get someone through skill building on the track of thinking about um, higher educational aspirations in the future. Um, what we see is that uh, more skills may, may build appetite for more school. Um, we also suggest that evaluations of all types of education programs in prison should consider a skills dimension in thinking about the groups of people that they are um, including as a control versus a treatment sample. So our conclusion is that there are 2.2 million people in prison right now who may pursue, sorry, people uh, behind bars. There are 1.5 million people in prison and another 700,000 in jails um, who may pursue their educations while they are incarcerated. Um, we, we stress here that educators, researchers, policymakers, and funding agencies should begin to look at prisons as a legitimate and important site of learning in American society. I want to note that during the 700% increase in prison populations, uh, there were many correction staff hired, but practically no additional educators were brought in to teach the growing numbers of people behind bars. And during the, the same period where we reached the stage of mass incarceration where we are now, Pell Grant eligibility was also revoked from people in prison. So while there's been an increase of the number of people in prison, a lot of interest among those who are in prison to pursue education, <coughs> including post-secondary education, there's been a narrowing of opportunity that has accompanied that growth. 
So we strongly encourage uh, all of our partners out in the field to think about prison as a place where you could study educational outcomes, not just criminal justice outcomes, and to take the educational <coughs> goals and possibilities of the people in prison very seriously. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the PIAC uh, team and uh, my team, Dr. Ruhil and Dr. Good. Uh, my name is Jing Hong, and uh, I will present, and Dr. Ruhil will join me to answer your questions. And uh, here, uh, our study focuses on three Ps. Programs, um, in PIAC data, there are, PIAC data is very rich, so there are many programs. Surveyed. So in our study, our programs are focused on adult basic uh, skills programs, and uh, GED programs, and job training programs. Uh, second P is the participation in these uh, programs. And uh, the third P is proficiency. And uh, we focus on literacy and numeracy. Uh, why do we study three Ps? <coughs> the world prison population rate based on United Nations estimates of national population levels is 145 per 100,000 people. But the United States is 670. And we have evidence to say Correctional education works. Correctional education can uh, enhance post-release employability and reduce recidivism. However, the, the recent 2018 RAND meta-analysis said that inmates who participated in correctional education programs were 28% less likely to recidivate the inmates who did not participate in correctional education programs. But they also found inmates who did not receive correctional education were as likely to obtain post-release employability as inmates who did receive it. So the question here, what's wrong with the programs? all, there are some other factors. We know the factors. One is social, uh, the social stigma. When people are out of the prison and they are uh, suffered from more difficulties to look for a job. But for programs, do we really do a good job to prepare them for the, the jobs, the post-release re-entry? So why PIAC? And at the very beginning I said, when, we, when I look at the PIAC, and we find PIAC is really rich data. We can compare skills, skills level, and skills use between household and the incarcerated population. We know they are different, they are different. But how different they are different? And the second, we connect programs, participation, and the proficiency. Uh, these are three selected research questions we would like to present here. First, we want to compare these two populations with three indices. Education levels, number two, literacy, numeracy levels, and number three, use of uh, skills in life and at work. The second question we want to ask why inmates who want to participate in these academic, we say the basic skills and GED programs, or job training programs, or CP, C, uh, uh, CTE programs. And question three, are inmates who participate in educational programs more likely to use more literacy numeracy skills than non-participants. So this is about whether they can continue these uh, skills and they can 
learn the skills and continue use the skills. And our method for first question, we look at a percentage of each population in education. So we look at low, no high school diploma, medium, high school diploma, and or some college, but they didn't have a degree. And high means they have degree, college degree or AA degree. And second, literacy or numeracy, we look at both plausible values and cutoff scores of the PIAC basic proficiency level. So that's level two. <coughs> and the use of literacy and or numeracy. And the, the question two, we look at the percentage of inmates who said they participated in the programs because they, are required, they were required. And the second group, they participated in the programs because they wanted to increase their employability and self-improvement. And third group is other, including family reasons. And the third research <coughs> question, we use the ordinal logistic regression and the dependent variables are the number of uh, literacy numeracy skills used in prison life. So if they say they read a newspaper, that's one. They read a books, that's two. They read a magazine, that's three. So yesterday, uh, some uh, researchers already said some uh, skills they do not use often, so we counted them. And the independent variables are the one is they completed or not completed a higher education level during their incarceration. And second, uh, they participated or not participated in vocational programs. The control variables, including <coughs> their proficiency levels uh, in numeracy and literacy. And the demographics, gender, age, and race. And uh, the third one, we, we control the inmates who said they want to enroll in academic programs. And the <coughs> results for the first question. Uh, only 6% of inmates have a high level education, but in the household, 36%. And uh, for the low level education, in, for the incarcerated uh, uh, population, 30% low level. But in the household uh, population, is only 14%. 29% of inmates have literacy below level two, but the household only 19%. 52% of inmates have a numeracy level below level two. In household, it is only 29%. And this is, uh, we visualized their life and their work, how they use their skills, reading, and literacy skills and numeracy skills. The, the orange bar represent the people incarcerated, and the blue bar represented the people in the household. And the second question, uh, the reasons. 73% of the inmates who enrolled in basic skills programs wanted to improve themselves or increase their chances for <coughs> employability. 79% of the inmates who during the incarceration completed a level of education higher than the level they had prior to prison wanted to increase their chances for employability and for self-improvement. And the third results. Inmates who participated in vocational training were more likely to use more at literacy and numeracy skills in prison than inmates who did not. Unfortunately, we did not find the same likelihood among people be, uh, who completed a higher education level. And for the implications, as almost one in three inmates have education levels lower than high school di diplomas, Expanding programs targeting basic skills is a must. And second, participation in vocational uh, <coughs> programs is positively associated with skill use. So CTE need to receive more resources in correctional education. 
Of course, our research has huge limitations. And uh, we explored the venue effects, dosage effects, and uh, delivery, course delivery, but unfortunately we didn't find any uh, useful results. It's our um, research uh, skills we still need to improve. So we need a more uh, study on these uh, effectiveness of programs. Second, in our model we found black uh, people incarcerated use more literacy skills than white uh, people in, in, in prison. We have not figured out why and uh, how we can use these resources. And uh, we suggest the demographic factors should be studied to identify possible cultural differences in the use of uh, co cognitive skills. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Patterson with Research Allies for Lifelong Learning. And my topic today is incarcerated adults with low skills. And um, continuing on from what my colleagues just presented, I took a look at a subgroup within the PIOC uh, prison study of adults with low skills. And what I mean by that is, is not simply low skills, but adults with less than high school educational attainment. And we'll see later how that connects with the low skills themselves. So by way of overview, um, I do have one short slide on overview, a little bit about research questions, and we'll take a look at some characteristics of the incarcerated adults with low skills and talk more about their current and future learning as well as some implications for practice. So what do we know so far? Um, we've already talked quite a bit this morning about how the prison population tends to be young and male, and, and that's definitely the case with the less than high school um, incarcerated adults. Uh, traditionally, many of them leave high school early. We know that as well, and, and so that connects uh, very quickly with having few job skills and opportunities. I also wanted to take a look, however, at um, some things that have not been brought up yet, and that's health concerns and learning disabilities, because those are two very important issues. On top of that, we realize that um, the vast majority of adults will be released at some point, and when they're released, they will be going to impoverished, stressed communities for the most part, and again, face limited employment opportunities, as has been said here this morning already. Um, if they are able to receive a high school equivalence credential in prison, um, that sends a positive signal to an employer about their ability and their achievements. Okay, so. What inspired me to do this study? This slide is actually both about significance and a finding. Um, two years ago, probably a lot of you were at this conference, as I was, and uh, Dr. Peggy Carr presented this slide. The only thing that I've changed here is uh, the title. But what we're looking at here are the average scores on literacy and numeracy from PIOC for adults with less than high school education. And um, so this slide is actually what she presented, but it inspired me to take a deeper look. Because as you can see, the, the darker solid bars represent um, the US prison population scores. The striped bars represent the US household scores. It's fairly similar for literacy. You can see that in the graph. Big difference in numeracy. However, I'm sure you're noticing that all of it is relatively low. Um, we're looking really at, a, if we look at, at the scaled levels, we're looking at a level one, almost bordering on level two, but definitely low skills. And so I was sitting in a chair, as you are today, at that point, and saying, hmm, 
what's up with that? What's going on? What can we find out? And so that inspired me to go ahead and, and do this research with, with the data set. So this, the sample that I looked at, we started with uh, about 1,300 adults um, in the survey uh, sample. And 1,270 of them actually took assessments. But the group that I focused on was adults with low skills, um, and, and particularly those with the low education attainment that we talked about, um, and ended up with a sample of 400 people. So of course, when you work with such a small sample, there's certain things you can do and certain things you cannot do. So um, bear that in mind as, as I go along. As far as research questions go, I had four of them. I wanted to take a look at characteristics and assess skills of incarcerated adults in the subgroup. And I also wanted to see, well, how did those differ uh, first by gender and then from the general population? Um, I've written five papers to date. And um, the first one that I looked at, uh, I looked at quite a bit of what had happened with the less than high school folks in the general population in terms of whether they learned or did not learn. Um, and so I, I had some questions uh, related as a follow on to, to that work. Um, and then I wanted to know, all right, well, what role does learning currently play in the lives of adults who are incarcerated? And what are their future learning goals? I thought that those would be important to take a look at. <laughs> so I looked at a number of, of variables as characteristics. They're all listed here. I'm not going to go through them in detail because you can, you can certainly take a look at those. Um, but again, I was, I was interested in um, what they were studying currently, learning strategies that they were using, and their reasons for participating. And then, as I said in, in the fourth research question, their future goals and their reasons um, for looking at, at learning that way. Uh, this is definitely a descriptive study. I did not do prediction. I did not um, attempt to um, look at causality in any way. Um, I thought it would be important to determine practical significance um, by looking at a 95% confidence interval as a threshold of twice the standard error to make sure that differences were truly meaningful. Okay, so some characteristics. We've already talked about you know, the, the predominance of men. The median age for uh, this subgroup was 35, uh, sorry, was uh, 25 to 34 years. Um, we saw quite a bit where uh, their parents' highest education level uh, <coughs> was also less than high school education attainment. Um, and that was occurring for you know, about the same percentage of mothers as for fathers. Um, some things that perhaps have not been brought up in, in previous studies with uh, less than high school adults in general, but particularly for the incarcerated population, is we have an overrepresentation of folks from the South. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that needs to be pointed out. Um, the employment information that I'm looking at here in this chart, what I've circled here, is the percentage of those that were unemployed. And of course, this is their status before they were incarcerated. So very a uh, high unemployment rate and, and low employment rates. Um, it looks like the circle shifted, that happens. <laughs> um, we also see a very high percentage of incarcerated adults with low skills um, who are not married. And many of them never have been married. And I think that's an important indicator um, as well. So do they have that connection with, with family, with partners, spouses, is important. Um, a few other things that I was able to find out about them is that on average, they got to grade 8.8. .8. That's very low. Um, and going along with that, we had a, a really high proportion of those who were leaving school up to the age of 15. That's very young to be leaving school. Um, to me, that's a very strong indicator of, of what's going on in their lives. Their top reasons for leaving school were things like they did not like school, um, 
they wanted to work, or some of them had already been involved in the criminal justice system at that point. The, the reasons were different for men and women. I will not go into that because of time constraints, but they, they were different. You can see that in the paper. Um, as far as health characteristics, high rates of fair or poor health, uh, particularly for the women, um, even more so than for the men. Um, and high rates of vision difficulties and hearing difficulties, essentially at tr twice the rate of what we were seeing in the general population of less than high school adults. Um, I've written quite a bit over the years on learning disabilities, and so that was one of my questions. You know, what rates of learning disabilities would we see? And it's very high. It's 37.1%, which is actually four times the rate of the general population overall, regardless of education attainment. So for current learning, um, a little bit more than a third were pursuing education while incarcerated. And um, what we noticed, because we limited to folks with less than a high school education, a lot of them were either in basic skills or in GED preparation. That was the only model um, of high school equivalency at that time. But the big, the big news here was um, that a very small proportion of them actually finished their programs um, and got the high school credential. We're only looking at 5%. Um, as has already been pointed out, about 70% want more education. So when we look at future reasons, they're talking about things like a job after release or increasing their knowledge and skills. Um, and of course, because of, of this group being um, a low skill group to begin with, they want to focus on that high school equivalency credential, but many of them did want to go on to post-secondary and associate degrees. So I will wrap up with implications for practice. Um, without at least that high school education, incarcerated and re-entering adults are going to be left in educationally vulnerable. Um, that's just the way it is. They'll be going back to those impoverished, stressed communities and, and trying to make their way through, as, as we've, we've heard quite a bit this morning already. <coughs> Um, and so I am recommending that correctional programs, reentry programs, need to fully assess adults uh, with less than high school education for skills and any unmet learning needs, including um, the possibility of learning disabilities if they have not been diagnosed already. Um, I believe that prison officials have an opportunity to review who's in the programs that they're offering. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there are a lot of programs offered, but who's in those programs, what are the parameters, and to find more ways to get folks involved um, in the programming so that they can complete um, the credentials that they need to. And then as adults re-enter society, I think those working with them need to be prepared for that and help them um, to uh, get their needs met um, in, in the context of the circumstances that they face. Thank you very much, and um, I'll look forward to the questions after Steve's discussion. Good morning. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't you stand up a second? We've been sitting here, no, just a second. Come on, stand up, wake up. <laughs> and you can do the hokey pokey. And now you can turn around, and now you can sit down. <laughs> thank you, uh, I want to thank the panel here for, for uh, these papers. And uh, I want to thank Jolay for asking me to participate um, and to uh, uh, bring some remarks about the papers. Uh, those are reality. Look out the window and I see Georgetown University. I came here in 1967 uh, to get my master's in linguistics across the street and I lived here in Arlington. In 1964, I think, uh, the mixed marriages were outlawed. In 1967, I'm still here 
uh, looking around and, and seeing the difference. I grew up in Chicago where we have plenty of segregation. But anyway, we're not that far from things that have, you know, that were really, that, that really affect a lot of what we're talking about, the prison population. Um, I, I taught in high school in the district. I taught history and Italian and to inner city kids, and I would have parties at my house, and I would get a lot of remarks from people, especially when we go to 7-Eleven to buy sodas and things. And so, I mean, that's great. thank God that's changed. Now I have one of my daughters lives in Falls Church with her uh, African-American husband and my grandson, who, what, black, white, who knows, who cares? And it's a different world, and I don't feel, so, so I'm, I'm optimistic that things have changed, but I just bring this up because it really, uh, as we talked a little bit about things yesterday, uh, there's a whole racial tint to everything we talk about when we talk about corrections. Um, I also <coughs> want to just take a second, for those of you who know John Linton, uh, the Correctional <coughs> Education Program Director who's retired, and his successor, Sean Addy's out here. Uh, he's, he's making up, he's doing okay. He has pancreatic cancer, but he's going through treatment right now, so for, uh, so we just, for those of you who are very religious, uh, I'd appreciate if you'd say a prayer for him. He is very religious. Um, <clears throat> so, and I'd also uh, like to, um, it's, it's very sad to watch the Bush funeral, because a lot of us here worked the Barbara Bush Foundation. Some of us were founders of that, and, and I think that was a time when prison education was beginning to get a little bit of, of uh, um, traction, because Barbara Bush visited prisons. She, we had inmates who were tutors who were on TV, um, and inmates who were being tutored, it's like we did people in the community who were learning to read. And, and so, uh, and I see that we've dropped back from that a little bit in my estimation from the, that kind of a thing. So that's, what, that's where I'm coming from. Um, so, and also my remarks will, I'm not a researcher, I got my PhD in reading disabilities, and when I took statistics courses, those are probably the most difficult things that I had, the course that I had to take, so. <laughs> and, and so I, I relied on a lot of friends to help me through that course. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about things I like in regards to these papers. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that they talked about, about, that has to do with practice and policy. Okay, so um, first, first off, the, the, the uh, paper by, by uh, here you go, let's do this. You're good, okay. you're good. By Delaney and Smith. And the, I think it's a very important paper because it raises some really good issues. It demonstrates, um, I'll, I'll, look at, I'll talk to the microphone here. It demonstrates how improving literacy and numeracy skills may lead to more educational interest for inmates. Uh, I spend my time now, I'm retired from several things, but I volunteer at the local jail and I run a tutoring program in conjunction with the college GED program, which is part-time. And we have tutors coming in from University College students. It's the Petey Green program, if I look it up, it's terrific. So up and down the East Coast. And I have spent two years face-to-face -to -face tutoring how to learn my high school math all over again and help them learn how to use the calculator. And I watch people come in, I don't know how to do math. I never was good in math. I don't know how to write. And within three months of intensive instruction, they're passing their GED, a couple of them with college-ready scores, 25 years old, 30 years old. I threw a, a Howard Community College catalog on the table after one of the guys passed his GED with college-ready scores, and he said, what's that for? I said, sign up for anyone you want. You're, you're not qualified. He had no idea mm -hmm. that he could go to a community college in Maryland and sign up, he qualified for any one of those courses, and then he could go on, you know, he could even go to a university and do the same thing. A lot of the folks we work with have no idea what education will do for them. And that's part of our job, to fill them in on some of that stuff. Um, anyway, I, I, so I like, I like the point about how, how uh, this can, their learning skills can really uh, lead, lead to much more interest on their part. Yeah, because I've seen it, and it's not research, that's observation, but um, I like how the paper discusses high school completion, how it affects and improves personal aspirations, and I like um, how it provokes thought about assessing cognitive skills as a better motivator than academic and vocational assessment. I, I, uh, I think that's, that's an interesting thing that we ought to research quite a bit more. Um, you know, is that a really uh, better indicator? I don't know, but we don't look at that too much. 
Um, some of the issues that all this brings up, we got to keep in mind that uh, I think many of us have studied uh, corrections, history of corrections. From the 1800s until the 1900s, Bible reading was really one of the most important things, important reasons. And a lot of groups came in to teach inmates how to read so they could, you know, they could be better, better people and understand the Bible better. Uh, it wasn't until the 1900s and, uh, that we really talked more about the necessity of, of literacy as the industrial age and, and uh, grew and, and all that stuff became more important. Um, one of the things that, that has point, been pointed out by several people is that um, we have fewer resources than need. I mean, it, it, I, I dare say, and I have some colleagues here from Maryland who worked uh, for the Correctional Education Program where I worked for 30 years, we had more resources 20 years ago than they have now. Uh, we had 10 or 15 percent of people in school, and I don't know what that is now. We put out 1,000 GEDs a year, and I, and I know it's like half that now. We had more vocational programs. And that is true, as the RAND study pointed out, what some of the folks here pointed out. It's, it's, it's true in many states, with some exceptions. Um, so also know that high school completion is not enough. It's just that gatekeeper for getting into other things. But you know, it is the step that needs to be taken to get into most vocational areas, which has been pointed out also in, in, in one of the papers. And so uh, we, we have, you know, we, we have to do a lot more, you know, bringing back Pell Grants is part of it. And I don't, I'm not sure what's gonna happen now politically, but it's, you know, we're almost at a time where we might get it back. Um, so I think, you know, so in terms of the first paper here, I think we have a lot of good issues and implications that were brought up. But I think one of the most important things is that motivation can be very strongly affected by building skills. Because I've seen it, I've seen people just turn their heads around about what they can do. So um, I think that was the most important thing that one of the most important things you got out of that particular paper. A glass of water here. In the next paper, let's see, I have, I, just, I think they're out of order here. So incarcerated uh, adults with low skills by uh, Margaret Patterson. Um, I think she presents an a, a more complete picture of the literacy deficits among U.S. incarcerated population. Uh, the PIAC uh, studies have done a lot of that, which hasn't been done before, so I appreciate that very much. Um, there's, um, it exp explicates issues with more demographic, demographic detail than ever before, um, and, and highlights a significantly ho higher percentage of learning disabilities that in turn complicates the solution for resolving literacy problems. When I started in corrections, which goes back to the 70s, um, we didn't have special ed, and we had Title I programs, and so we were trying to reach the under 21s in the prisons and in the juvenile facilities with some extra services. And then <coughs> IDEA came along, and uh, a lot of, no, very few states implemented IDEA in corrections. I worked for the state superintendent of schools at this time in Maryland, and I went to the uh, special ed department and I asked the director, when can we start training our teachers and getting special ed services in the prisons? And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, the law clearly says that if they have an IDA, they need to be served up to a certain age. And in Maryland, it was up to 22. And they said, well, you don't have any problem. You don't have any, I, I, uh, you know, I, there, nobody has an IEP in the prisons. I said, you want to bet? And we did a study, we came up with 200 IEPs. And then they started realizing they had something to, that they had to do. And we then started training teachers, special ed teachers. And they still have a special ed program, but a lot of states still don't do it. And I dare say most, most jails do not do it. Montgomery County, right nearby, the director several years ago asked me when I was working for the state if he had to take care of special ed. And I said, yes, you do. And so he asked me to come in and talk to the uh, people in public schools. And again, they said, we are short 33 special ed teachers in public schools. We can't spare any. And so the director of corrections does like a lot of them do. Well, I'm going to sue you. What do you mean? The Department of Corrections is going to sue the Board of Ed? Yes. And that's what caused, they just didn't want to go to court over this. And so now they have two special education teachers coming to their jail full time. It's a big problem. That's an exceptional jail. So I, I'm glad you pointed that out. So. Um, 
I'm running out of time, so let's talk, go to the other paper. Um, okay. And so, uh, you told me how to pronounce your name, and I'm not going to dare. To, you tell me what it rhymes with. She said, my name rhymes with King Kong. So <laughs> I am not going to try to pronounce it. <laughs> and, and so, uh, I, I, I liked your paper very much, that the, the three of you have done. And um, I, think, I think it really gives, uh, talks a lot about the major programs that we do have. And it clarifies motivation uh, quite a bit uh, for self-improvement and employment. And that's what we always kind of traditionally look at. Uh, it compares literacy and numeracy skills of incarcerated with the free community populations very, very well. And uh, it, it explains how we don't emphasize enough in our state and federal prison systems. Um, and it, the other thing that I really thought was unique was how you've really clarified how GED grads often move on to vocational education. Mm -hmm. And I know in my own state of Maryland, that was a re requisite for most of the programs. You didn't get to voc ed until you finished your vocational programs. And some people may say that's not fair, but the reality for most of those trades is that's what happens in the community. Mm -hmm. So there is a direct relationship. And I also put it, what didn't, wasn't mentioned in this paper, there's a kind of a conceptual discussion or, or maybe an argument about the value of academic education, like a, a, an academic BA degree, versus vocational education, which leads uh, to uh, people uh, changing their, their ways, so to speak, from being incarcerated to, to, to the free world. And I don't think there should be an argument about that. I think all of it's very valuable. People who go, it's very obvious people will go to four-year colleges while incarcerated, like to Bard and others, San Quentin. There, the, many of them change because, as uh, Stanley t uh, pointed out, you get a hunger for things, mm -hmm. a hunger for something you never had before, maybe. And, and, and you can do that, I think, through academic programs, vocational programs, through GED programs. So I don't think there's really a fight about it. There shouldn't be a fight about that. Or we shouldn't be fighting each other because we didn't have enough resources to fight over. Mm -hmm. It's like three, like three dogs scrapping for a bone. You know, it's not, it's not worth our fight. You know, we ought to get together. So um, I, could, I could go on with a lot more implications for these papers, but I'll leave it at that. I just, I think that um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, uh, we don't have an attitude in this country yet to put more money into prisons. When, before the RAND study, we had some recidivism studies, and I would do advocacy in Maryland, and I'd done national level, which I still do, and the politicians would say, well, until you prove that education changes, why should we invest in it when we have such a big need in the community? And I said, and I, so, I, okay, so let's get some research. So the RAND Corporation comes along and shows a direct relationship that there is a causality, although some researchers still fight about that too. So I go back to some of the same people on Capitol Hill and they say, okay, it does change. If you get more education, people change. We should put more education there, but you know what? We don't have enough money for the public schools. We don't, you know, so the priorities have changed. So we're still fighting the same battles uh, and I hope, uh, I'm hopeful that some things will change. We have a criminal justice bill that's been put together by the right and the left, and many people are hopeful, but now Senator uh, McConnell wants to hold it back. And um, so I don't know what's going to happen with that, but I think that's an indication that we can change, and I hope we change. And I think the PIOC studies and the papers people are doing with the data are tremendously helpful, and, and I hope we can take this and, and go forward with our cause. Thank you very much.